Well, howdy, 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 everybody! Once again, my name is Rory. I'm one of the pastors on the team here, and I'm delighted, dare I say, even excited to be with you this morning. Uh, we are in week number five of our teaching series titled A New Beginning, and we have been navigating uh, the history of the early church, how this movement that started 2,000 years ago is continuing to have a reverberating effect 2,000 years later. But before we begin, we want to say hi to everybody on all of our campuses, as well as everybody watching online. Why don't you give yourself a little round of applause. We love you. If you're sitting next to somebody, why don't you turn to them and say, I'm ready. ready. And if you're sitting next to somebody else, turn to them and say, I I prayed that I'd sit next to you. (laughs) And if you are sitting next to your crush, here's what I want you to do right now. I want you to pull a Bible out, go to the book of Numbers real quick, just read it over just a little bit, then look at your crush and say, hey, I realized, you know, I was reading the book of Numbers and your number's not in here. Can I get that? (laughs) Just trying to help you out. Church is a great place to meet your spouse. Come on, somebody. Uh, It'll be 10 years for me and my wife this August. We met at church. It's a great place. Anyways, hey, let's pray and we'll dive in. Lord Jesus, your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We pray now by the power of your spirit in this space and in this place, God, that you would move that you would move mightily, Lord, that you would change us from the inside out. You would sanctify us and make us more like you. Lord, when we walk out of the four walls of this place, we want to look, we want to love, we want to lead in our lives more like you. So God, help us turn our theology into biography. Help us to not only be hearers of the word, but to be doers of the word. Jesus, we love you. And it's in your name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. I want to start by asking you a question I've asked you before and then sharing with you some stats that I have shared with you before. The question that I want to ask you is this, how do you tame an elephant? How do you tame an elephant? Well, the way that you tame an elephant is this, when there is a newborn baby elephant uh, entering the world, a trainer will come and take that baby elephant and they will tie a large rope around its hind leg. They'll take the other end of that rope and tie it around some large immovable object like a big boulder or giant tree and that baby elephant will be there and it will tug and tug and pull and pull on that rope only to be thwarted time and time and time again. And ultimately what happens is this baby elephant falls into a psychological state known as learned helplessness. And they fall into this state so much so that even when they are released and they grow in stature to be a full-grown adult elephant weighing several tons, that same trainer can come back, and again, this time not with a giant rope, but with a piece of string. And they'll tie that string around the hind leg of that fully grown adult elephant. And they'll take the other end of that string and they'll tie it to a twig. And they'll put the twig in the ground, and that giant elephant weighing several tons, it will not move. In fact, it won't even try. Why? Because it's fallen into a state of learned helplessness. Interestingly enough, if you were to study the capital C church in North America, you might also conclude that it too has fallen into a state of learned helplessness. Let me share with you some stats that I've shared with you before. Did you know that 6,000 churches close their doors every year in the United States? Did you know that 85% of churches have plateaued or declining in their attendance? There's some good news in the fact that 800 churches are being planted every year. However, you'd actually need to plant 10,000 churches just to keep up with the population increase. See, it almost seems that the capital C church in North America has fallen into the state of learned helplessness. It almost seems that we have been tamed. And some of you ask, well, how and why Is this happening? And some would say, well, it's because of the advent of youth sports, siphoning families in their Chevy Suburbans away from church services and off to soccer and softball tournaments on the weekend. Others would say it's because the church has some bad PR. The church that most of the world sees on the news is anti-gay, anti-women, anti-science, and just straight up antiquated. But I would say something different. 
As I prayed, as I studied, as I sought God this week, I feel like the real reason that we have fallen into this state as a capital C church, the reason that we have been tamed is because we're just not that attractive. We're just not that attractive. You know, we've been studying the early church the last few weeks, and what we see in the early church is a church that's magnetic, that's attractive, that's growing in droves, and yet the stats don't lie. We're not seeing that these days. See, we read this in Acts chapter 2 about the early church, this attractive magnetic church. It says, they, the church, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. See, they actually loved God's word and they loved each other. And they broke bread and they prayed and everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs being performed by the apostles. People were getting healed. People who were dead were being made alive. Card-carrying Christian killers named Saul were actually being converted to Christian followers who are taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. Amazing things were happening in the early church and all the believers, they were together and they had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts. There was joy and they praised God, enjoying the favor of all the people and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. See, there was something magnetic. There was something attractive about this early church. In extra-biblical literature, you learn even more. I was reading this week, and we see that uh, this group of Christians, they had actually pull their money together, and they would buy freedom for prostitutes and slaves. That's what the early church did. When Roman fathers would take their newborn babies out into the fields and leave them there to die, which was common practice in the day, it was the Christians who would run into the fields, grab those babies, adopt them into their families, and they did this in droves. In 165 AD, when Rome was hit by the plague and 5,000 people were dying every day, most of the citizens were fleeing those cities. But what did the Christians do? They ran in and they invaded those cities and they cared for and they consoled and they fed and they prayed for those who were dying at risk to their own life. In the 4th century AD, there was this large Christian meeting that took place, and 318 delegates from all over the world, they gathered together, but all but 12 of them had either lost an eye, had their hand cut off, or were walking with a limp because they had been persecuted for their faith. Out of 318, 312 had lost an eye, had had their hand cut off, or were walking with a limp because they had been persecuted persecuted. But here's what the writers of history say. Despite their persecution, they just kept on loving people. You see, there was something magnetic. There was something attractive about this early church. But again, the stats don't lie. Somewhere along the way, we have lost our groove. We have lost our mojo. We have lost our Jesus swag. But I'm here to tell you, if Stella got her groove back in 1998, (laughs) certainly the church can get its groove back in 2019. Amen? Amen. So here's what we're going to do. You ask, well, how do we get our groove back? Well, it starts with three things. Starts with the heart, moves to our head, and then ultimately moves to our hands. It's the heart, it's the head, and the hands. If you were here with us last week, you heard Pastor Jeff talk about the heart. And he described it as this God quake, this Jesus revelation that you need to have. If you are going to be set out to live the life that God has called you to live, if you are going to be a magnetic, attractive person that is going to draw people who are far from God and bring them near, it starts with the Jesus revelation. It starts with the God quake. It starts with your heart. And I've got great news for you. If you've never had this God quake, 
Here's what God says in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. Actually, he says this seven times within Scripture. If you seek me, you will find me. If you seek me with all of your heart. If you seek me, you will find me if you seek me with all of your heart. See, God is not behind a cloud somewhere saying, catch me if you can. No. He's saying, I'm here. Knock and the door will be open to you and I will give you a revelation and it will be a revelation of who I am. That I am the son of the living God. That I did step off my throne. That I did come to this planet on a rescue mission for you to save you from yourself. And to pay for your sins on that cross. And all of your sin and all of your shame, it was on my shoulders and it was buried. But on the third day, I rose again, defeating that sin, defeating that shame, and allowing you to be set free to live the abundant life that I have called you to live. But it starts there. But here's a problem. Sometimes that revelation has a hard time traveling from our heart to our head. It's 18 inches, but it has a hard time moving from right here to right here. And many of us in this space, we've had that heart revelation, but then we get stuck right up here. See, I don't know if you know this or not, there is a battle that is being waged for your mind. And in fact, that's what we're going to talk about Today, see many of us, we've had that Jesus revelation, but it hasn't moved all the way up here. And we still let the lies and the deception of the enemy keep us from living the attractive, magnetic, abundant life that Jesus has called us to live. And so today we're going to tackle that battle within the mind head on. And to do that, I want to introduce you to someone. His name was Saul. It's now Paul. We meet him in Acts chapter 9. He is a card-carrying Christian killer. But on a 150-mile stretch of road between Jerusalem and Damascus, he is knocked off his donkey and his life is changed. He has this encounter with Jesus and it's a catalytic encounter that then sets him on a different trajectory. And the person we meet in Acts chapter 9 is a completely different person than the one we see in Acts 28. Paul's life changes, but during that time, he changes the history of the world. And I believe that if we can have an encounter with Jesus and we can allow him to shape our thinking and our mind, we might too be able to change the world in the name of Jesus. What I love about Paul is that when we meet him in Acts 9, he's a dude who's struggling. He's a dude who's actually losing the battle within his mind. But again, the person we see in Acts 28 is a very different person. By Acts 28, he's actually mastered his mind. He's actually won the battle in his mind. He's learned to take every thought captive and actually make it obedient to Christ. And so that's the journey that I would love for us to go on. And again, it's crazy because early in Paul's writings, he he sounds kind of crazy. And I take a lot of comfort in that because often in my mind, I feel crazy. I I really do. Let me read this from Acts, or sorry, from Romans chapter 7. This is what Paul said one time. He said, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is the sin that is living in me that does it. Excuse me, Paul. You sound loco, dude. But here's the good news for us. See, Paul, he battled. Again and again and again and again in his mind, he battled, he fought, he won, he took ground, and over time, he mastered his thoughts. And even when life was stacked against him in a Roman prison, he could say things that were otherworldly because he had learned to capture his thoughts and make them obedient to Christ. 
And again, I believe if we can take some of the steps that Paul took today, I believe that we will again become that magnetic group of people that is attractive to the world around us, that people will look at us and say, what do they have that I don't have? And we will be able to tell them we have Jesus alive and well and at work within our Lives. So here's what I want to do to kind of lay a foundation for where we're headed the next few minutes. I want to read these other words from Paul. It's from 2 Corinthians chapter 10. If you have your phones or notepad, I want to encourage you to take notes because what you write down, you tend to remember. So take these notes, write stuff down. But we're looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. Paul starts by saying, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war. Everybody say wage war. Wage war. See, there is a battle that is going on, and it's a battle for your mind. But we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they, are, they have divine power. Everybody say power. That is the Greek word dunamis. It's where we get our English word dynamite. We have supernatural dynamite power to demolish what? Strongholds. Everybody say strongholds. What is a stronghold? It's the Greek word akamora. It means a fortified prison, but it's not a physical prison. It's a psychological prison. It's a prison within your mind, and it's built and constructed by the lies and the deception of the enemy. But we have power to demolish those strongholds, those prisons, and we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every every thought and we make it obedient to Christ. So to recap just one more time, there is a battle and it's a battle for your mind. And within our minds, all of us, myself included, we have these prisons that have been constructed and they've been constructed by the lies and the deception of our enemy, Satan. And we listen to those lies, and those lies actually hinder us from living the life that God has called us to live, that he actually died for us to live. But Paul says that we have power. We have supernatural power to demolish those strongholds. We can literally obliterate those strongholds, set ourselves free, and live the attractive life that God has called us to live. And so here's what we're going to do in the next few moments. One, we're going to learn to recognize any thought that is not from God. Two, we're going to learn to capture that thought. And three, we're going to learn how to make it obedient to Christ. So once again, what we're going to do is we're going to recognize any thought that is not from God. We're going to learn how to capture that thought, and then we're going to learn how to make it obedient to Christ. And some of you might ask, well, why does all of this matter? And it's because the life that you have is a reflection of the thoughts that you think. The life you have is a reflection of the thoughts that you think. In fact, you might want to write down this next statement. The life, your life, my life, our life, it is always moving in the direction of your strongest thoughts. Your life, it is always moving in the direction of your strongest thoughts. And we know this because we see this in Scripture. Proverbs 23, 7, it says, For as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. For as a man or a woman thinks in their heart, so they are. So as you think, so you become. So if you think that you can't, guess what? You probably won't. But if you believe that through Christ you can, then you probably can. If you believe that you're a victim, always suffering at the hands of someone or something else, then guess what? You will probably always be a victim. However... If you believe that you have victory through Christ, you can actually move from victim to victor. If you're always looking at the problems in your world, your problems will always probably overwhelm you. But if instead you're looking for solutions, you are more than likely to find solutions. I've got this strange habit. I I like to watch church channels late at night. Confessions. So I look at the TBN, I look at the Daystar, all the church channels, and a few months ago, I was perusing, I think it was TBN, and Joyce Meyer came up. 
And uh, you know, she had this nugget, and it was a real truth-filled nugget that kind of changed some stuff in my heart. And uh, it was talking about the mind. And here's what she had to say. She said, uh, most of life's battles, they are won or lost in the mind. Most of life's battles, they are won or lost in the mind. Because again, the mind is a battlefield. Some of you who are children of the 80s, you thought that love was a battlefield. Thank you, Pat Benatar. (laughs) But I want to tell you that your mind is a battlefield. And it's a battle between God's truth about you and Satan's lies to you. A war between God's truth and between the enemy's deception. So to help us win this battle in the mind, the first thing I want us to do is I want us to think about what we think about. I want us to think about what we think about. I'm going to tell you a story. Perhaps you've heard it before. There were two twin brothers. One was an incurable optimist, the other an incurable pessimist. Their parents were kind of worried about these two boys and their extreme personalities. So they took the boys to a psychologist and the psychologist got an idea. And so he takes the first little boy, the little pessimist, and he takes him to this room. And this room is filled, overflowing with brand new toys. And he walks the little boy into the room, this little pessimist boy, and all of a sudden, he just starts crying. He's just crying, and the psychologist is baffled. What in the world is going on? He says, what, what's wrong? Look at all these toys. Don't you want to play with them? And he just starts crying. Oh, if I play with them, they're just going to break. I'm just going to break them all. He, she couldn't believe it. So he goes over to the little optimistic boy, and he's got another plan for him. He takes him to a different room. This room was not filled to the brim with toys. It was actually filled to the brim with poo, with horse manure. And the little optimistic boy walks into the room and he gets this big old smile on his face. And he is so excited, so excited. In fact, he runs up this big pile of poo and he just starts digging. He's just digging in here. And and the the psychologist, look at what in the world are you doing? What's happening here? And the little boy says, well, with all this poo in here, surely there's a pony. (laughs) Right? So here's what we're going to do right now. We're going to think about what we think about. We're going to do something I'm going to call a thought audit. And we're going to understand how we've been thinking. And so we've got some extremes. The first extreme is the negative and positive extreme. So I want you to think about what you think about. Think about your thoughts. This past week, have your thoughts been more negative or more positive? Have they been more negative? That little pessimistic boy in the room full of toys, but he just feels like they're just going to break if he touches them. Or have you been more positive? You're that little boy who's looking for the pony in the poo. You're just like, woo. So where do you land? Are you more negative or are you more positive in your thinking? There's some other extremes. The next extreme is this. Have you been more worried or more peaceful in your thinking recently? Have you been more worried or more peaceful? Think about this last week. Were you worried about what others thought about you or what they thought about your kids were you worried about your job or your finances? Are you currently worried about how long I'm going to preach today? Are you, like, what, what, were you worried about getting that Instagram caption just right? Like, were you worried, or instead, were you more peaceful? Were you not rushing throughout your day? Were you not anxious over things? Were you able to sleep well at night? Were you more worried, or were you more peaceful? Here's the third extreme. Were your thoughts this week, were they more worldly, or were they more eternal? Were they more worldly or were they more eternal? Worldly thoughts, thinking about, well, what can I get? How will this benefit me? It's about me, me, me. Or were they more eternal? That I have been blessed, but I've been blessed to be a blessing. My job here on earth is to bring God's kingdom come for other people. Have you been thinking about yourself or you've been thinking about how you can bless other people? more worldly or more eternal. Where have your thoughts been this week? We've got to think about what we think about because, again, ultimately, we know that our life is always moving in the direction of our strongest thoughts. Our life is always moving in the direction of our strongest thoughts. So now I have a question for you. 
And the question is this. If we know the truth that our life is always moving in the direction of our strongest thought, as we think, so we become. If that's the truth, here's the question. Are you excited about where your thoughts are taking you? Are you excited about where your thoughts are taking you? Because again, our life, it's always moving in the direction of our strongest thoughts. So are you excited about where your thoughts are taking you? And I'm going to be incredibly transparent right now. If you were to talk to me a few months ago, my answer to that question would have been an absolute no. Sometimes you see us up here on stage and you might be tempted to think, well, they have it all together. I love that we have a senior pastor who's willing to just share his life with us. He would be the first one to say, I don't have it all together. And I'll be the second one to say, I don't have it all together. We don't have it all together. We're in this journey together. We're trying to find and follow Jesus just like all of you. We don't have it together. And again, my answer to that question a few months ago would have been an absolute no. I did not like where my thoughts were taking me. I'm going to be really transparent. I'm going to share with you some of the self-talk, some of the thoughts that were firing across my synapses just a few months ago. And you're probably going to be like, dude, uh, this pastor, uh, he's crazy right now. He needs counseling. The truth is I do need counseling. Don't leave the church. It's all good. Um, (laughs) Here's the thing. Here were the thoughts that were crossing my my head. I would say things in my head like, well, I'm not a good preacher. I'll never be able to do what Jeff does. I don't know the Bible like him. He's forgotten more of the Bible than I will ever know. I'll never be able to provide enough for my family. How am I ever going to give these four kids what they need? I can't even afford the life that I had growing up and we didn't have much. How am I ever going to raise these kids right? How am I ever going to make enough time for them? They're probably just going to become those church kids. I'm not a good son. I mean, I move a thousand miles away just as my mom is getting sick. Now I'm not there to help. What a way to treat your parents, Rory. I've got these stupid old jankety cars. Tires are blowing off on the freeway. I'm going to kill my wife and my kids. I'm tired. Do people even know what I do around here? This ministry needs this. Etiwana needs this. Can you do this? I've got to meet this person. If I don't meet this person, they're probably going to leave the church. And these were my thoughts. And I diagnosed myself. And the diagnosis I gave myself was that I had a bad case of stinking thinking. I had a real bad case of stinking thinking. Stole that from Joyce Meyer too. Boom. Real bad case, but... By God's grace, I decided to do something about it. And so over the last few months, I've been on this journey, and I've read some books, and I've listened to some podcasts, and I've listened to some messages, and uh, God's been doing some work in my heart. He's been changing me from the inside out. He's been teaching me to overcome my stinking thinking because ultimately, again, we know that our life is moving in the direction of our strongest thoughts, and I had some real bad thoughts. And I want to help you if you're struggling with your stinking thinking, and probably all of us in this room, to some degree or another, we are probably struggling in this area. But if we are to become that magnetic, attractive, early church-like group of people, then we got to win the battle in our mind. So in order to win the battle in our mind, here's what I'd love for us to do. I'd love for us to identify right now the number one stronghold that is holding you back. I want us to identify the number one stronghold that is holding us back. What again, what is a stronghold? Remember, it's a lie that is keeping us prisoner. It's deception that's holding us captive. It's a thought from the enemy that he is using to keep us from living the life that God wants us to live. And you hear these often in your self-talk. You hear things like, well, I'm never going to be enough. My past is too bad. After all I've done, God could never use me. I can't trust anybody. I can't get close to anybody. After what I did or what they did to me, I could never trust anybody again. I'm never going to be in a job that I love. I'm never going to get ahead. I'm never going to have enough. All of my relationships, no matter how hard I try, they always fall apart. I'll never break free from this addiction. I'll never get in shape. I can never change. You know, some of you, you have those thoughts or similar thoughts bouncing around your brain every single day. And again, why is this important? Because those thoughts, whenever we have a thought, our brain is literally redesigning itself around those thoughts. 
There's actually a changing chemical makeup of your brain. Every single thought creates a neurochemical change in your body. So if you think a positive thought, your body rewards you with this legal drug called dopamine. Now, some of you get excited because you heard the word dope in church. But it gives you a legal buzz, a quick hit, a thrill, and you know that feeling. You know, someone gives you good news. Boom! Dopamine. Someone likes or comments on your Instagram post. Boom! Dopamine. Somebody says, ooh, you're looking good today. Dopamine. Your wife says, hey, I'm thinking about you. Come home. Dopamine, right? You know, this stuff, it's this little chemical hit, that high, that thrill, and your brain is saying, well, I like that thought. Let's think that thought again. And what happens is the more you think that thought, the more you're creating what scientists call as neural pathways. You're creating neural pathways in your brain. Your brain creates a path, kind of like when you walk across the grass nonstop in the same place. And the more you think that thought, the easier it is to think that thought again. In fact, if you think that thought enough, that thought actually becomes the default in your brain. So if you tell yourself you don't have enough, over and over and over again. You create a pathway where it's easier to believe that you will never have enough. But in order to change your thinking, you actually have to create different pathways. You have to create new positive paths that your thoughts travel on. So for example, if I've got nothing but a negative path, I have to stop and say, wait, that thought is not helpful, it's not productive, it's not from God, I'm going to capture it, and now I'm going to walk down a brand new God-honoring pathway. I capture that old negative thought, and I'm going to walk a new pathway. Let me give you some examples. Um, You know, i got four kids, seven, five, and twins who are three. And often when I come home, my house is very chaotic. In fact, here's a little picture. My wife's going to kill me. So this is our house, and this is tame. This is incredibly tame. Like most of the time, those pillars are thrown all over the place. we got forts. Those duplos are all over the ground. Like this is real tame. But when I walk into the house and I see that chaos, I have this pathway that I'd walk down. And that pathway would say, hey, just yell. Just get angry. And I would yell and I'd get angry. It's just chaotic. But over the last few months, I've been trying to take that thought captive that says whenever there's chaos, just yell. Nope. Take that thought captive. I'm going to walk a new pathway. And so I started walking a new pathway. When I drive home, before I even walk through the door, I count to 10. Sometimes I count to 500. It's cool. (laughs) But I count, and then when I walk through the door, the first thing I do is I go embrace my kids, hug my kids, tell them I love them. And then I go find my wife, and I hug her, and I tell her I love her, and I give her a kiss. And what I'm doing is I'm capturing that thought. I'm choosing not to walk down that old pathway any longer, but instead I'm creating a new pathway and I'm walking down it. And interestingly enough, that old pathway, the grass is starting to grow up again. And it's not as easy for me to walk down that path anymore because I've created a new God-honoring neural pathway. For some of you, your issue is when you don't feel good, you make a beeline towards the refrigerator, right? You think, well, I don't feel good, so I'm going to get that ice cream. And you go and you get that ice cream, and you get that Ben and Jerry's, you get that Chunky Monkey, and you start to eat it, and it gives you a little dopamine hit, woo, right away, and you feel good for a moment, but then that problem compounds, and you actually feel worse about yourself. So instead of making a beeline towards the refrigerator every time you feel bad, what you need to do is when you feel bad, you need to capture that thought. And rather than moving towards that refrigerator, instead, you need to choose to eat something healthy. Or maybe you need to choose to go on a walk. Or even better yet, if you're like me, I eat all the bad food late at night, maybe you just need to choose to go to bed. But you need to take that thought captive. Say, no, this is not God-honoring. This is not who I am. And instead, I'm going to walk a new path, and I'm going to walk this way with Jesus. Does that make sense? You're creating new neural pathways. Romans 12, 2 says this. It says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. I would say, do not conform to the pathways of this world, but instead be transformed by the what? 
by the renewing of your mind. See, science would say when you create new neural pathways, you're rewiring your brain. But God's word actually says, no, you're renewing your mind. So here's my assignment. I want us to identify that one stronghold that is holding us back. What is that one stronghold in your world that is holding you back from living the life that God has called you to live? Name it, because you cannot defeat what you cannot define. You've got to define that stronghold. Give it a name. Define it. You cannot defeat what you cannot define. And then here's what we're going to do right now. You're going to name it. What is it? Define it, and now here's what we're going to do. We're going to attack it. And the way we're going to attack it is we're going to name the truth that demolishes that stronghold. We are going to name the truth that demolishes that stronghold. There's a story of a man in Russia who's driving along the freeway, and there's a large fire up in the hills. And along the side of the road, he sees this little black bear cub, and he looks up to the hills, and he sees its mother, but its mother has been burned to death. And so he pulls off and he grabs this little black bear cub and he takes him home and he actually then goes to the store and he buys a little bottle and he gets some milk and he starts feeding and caring for this little black bear. And this little black bear over the weeks and months grows and grows and it gets so big that he can't care for it anymore and there's a bar owner in town. And the bar owner knows this guy has a bear and he actually asks, hey, can I buy that bear for my bar? So the man says, fine, yeah, absolutely, pays him a sum of money, takes the black bear, and he builds this little 8 by 10 cage for this bear. And he sets up shop in the bar, and he starts selling tickets for people to be able to go and to see the bear. And so people, they come, they see the bear, but they eventually start mocking the bear. They start yelling at the bear. They take cigarettes, and they burn the bear. They throw things at the bear. This bear is being abused in this little 8 by 10 cage. I mean, just every day walks this 8 by 10 trail. Well, eventually one day somebody comes into the bar. It's a businessman from Germany, and he sees this beautiful bear, but he sees that it's been abused, and he says, I, I got to buy this bear. So he goes to the bar owner and makes him a deal that this bar owner can't refuse, gives him a huge sum of money and says, I want that bear. And the bar owner says, okay. And so this man from Germany takes the bear, flies him home to Germany where he's got this small zoo. So the bear comes, they get him to the zoo, they unlock him from that eight by 10 cage and they put him in a new setting. And they were thinking, well, yeah, it'll take a few days to get acclimated, but a few days turned into a few weeks and turned into a few months, and this, this bear just kept walking that 8 by 10 trail, would just not go out into its surroundings, was just stuck walking 8 by 10. Eventually, an American man came to this little zoo, and the German zoo owner told him about just this bear, this beautiful bear that just would walk this little circle, this 8 by 10 circle. And this man from the States, he just had his heart broken, and he thought, well, you know what, I, I want to buy this bear, but I'm going to take this bear back out to the wild. I'm going to take him back out into Alaska. We're going to get a team together. We're going we're to get him acclimated to the wild. We're going to let him live free. And so he buys the bear. They, they fly the bear to Alaska. They go hundreds of miles into the Alaska wilderness. They've got a whole team there. Uh, they get the bear out. Other bears start coming. They're trying to build rapport with this bear, but this bear just keeps walking. Eight by ten. Eight by ten. Eight by ten. They try, they try, they try food, trying to get other bears around and try everything, but he just keeps walking eight by ten. Eight by ten. Eight by ten. It goes on weeks, it goes on months, eventually goes an entire year, and then the team finally has to decide they have to put this bear down. Here's what I want to say about that bear. That bear was not trapped by metal bars. That bear was trapped by mental bars. Many of you, including myself, we are not trapped by metal bars, but we are trapped by mental bars that are holding us captive, holding us 
from the life that God so desires for us to live, the life that he actually died for us to live. We're trapped by these mental bars, and I'm saying today is the day that we break free, that we start attacking, we start leveraging the dunamis, the dynamite supernatural power of God to demolish those mental bars so that we can walk freely with him, so that once again we can become attractive and magnetic people who bring people who are far from God near to him. And so you'd ask yourself, well, how? How do we do this? Well, we do it by speaking God's truth over the lies of the enemy. We speak God's word over the lies of the enemy. What does this really, really look like? Well, let me just show you. You want to know how you overcome this. Well, uh, let's go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. So we, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought and make it obedience to Christ. That word captive in the Greek, it literally means to take at sword point. It means to take those lies at sword point. I love this because it reminds us of Ephesians 6 where Paul talks about the armor of God. That we have the breastplate of righteousness. We have the helmet of salvation. We have the belt of truth. We have the shoes of the gospel of peace. We have the shield of faith. All these defensive weapons. But then there's this one offensive weapon. And what is it? It is the sword of the Spirit. And so with the sword of the Spirit, we take captive every thought. And we make it obedient to Christ. What does this look like? Well, when you start talking to yourself and you start saying things in your mind, well, like, I can't get it all done. No. We capture that. We capture it. We hold it. And then with the sword of the spirit, we demolish it. We say, no, I can't get it all done. No. When I am weak, he makes me strong. That's what God's word says. So we strike that lie down with the word of God and we create a new neural pathway. Well, I'm not attractive. No, the word of God says I am fearfully and wonderfully made, but I'm just miserable and I'm always hurting. No, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Well, I can't overcome. I'm always going to be alone. No, he will never leave me. He will never forsake me, God's word says. I'm always going to be addicted. I will never overcome this addiction. No, I am an overcomer by the blood of the lamb and the word of his testimony. We speak God's truth over the lies. We take it captive, those lies, with the sword of the spirit. And when you do this, you remind yourself who you are and whose you are. You are a son or a daughter of the most high God. He loves you. He died to set you free. You are not captive to the lies of the enemy. You are not trapped by mental bars. Jesus has set you free. Now walk and be free. This week, we're going to try something we've never really tried before. We want to give you some tools. See, church doesn't just happen here on the weekend. It happens Monday through Friday as well. And we understand that what happens Monday through Friday is a battle, and it's hard. So we want to put some tools in your hand this week to help you win the battle in the mind, to become that attractive Christ followers that others look at and say, what do they have that I don't have? And so here's what we're going to do. If you have your phone, take it out right now. We've got some resources that if you text stinking thinking to 909 552-8020, what's going to happen is you're going to get a PDF, and then during the week you're going to get some YouTube videos that help you walk through these PDFs. What you're going to see are three documents. The first is a thought audit, just kind of like what we did earlier in service, but it's a thought audit for you to really understand what you've been thinking about and how to overcome that. The second thing you're going to get is a tool for scripture memorization. You got to hide God's word in your heart. And there's three steps, simple process that I use to memorize scripture. It's really helped me. It's helped me in this past season to speak truth over the lies of the enemy. You got to hide God's word in your heart so when the lies come, you can attack it 
You can hold it captive with the sword of the Spirit. So there's a real simple tool as well. It points you to an app that can help you memorize Scripture. And then the third thing there is uh, what I'd like to end with. Uh, these are called daily affirmations. It's a way I kind of preemptively go into my day with Christ and I remind myself of who I am in him. These are not the same as, as scripture memorization, but this is just speaking God's truth about me. You know, God has a purpose and a plan for each of you. Each of our purposes and plans look a little bit different, but I know who I am in Christ. I know how he's wired me. So each morning, the last few weeks, I've been speaking these affirmations over my day, preemptively just trying to set my day in a positive course, knowing who I am and what I've been created for. And so here's what my daily affirmations look like, and I pray that maybe this would be catalyst for you an opportunity for you to say, well, maybe I'm going to try this daily affirmations thing. You know, if I've been trying to win this battle in my mind, you know, I, I'm not where I want to be, but I'm definitely not where I was. I'm not. And by God's grace, I'm going to continue to move. But this tool has really helped me. I stole this from Craig Groeschel, like a great tool to just like daily affirm you and what you've been called to do. So here are my affirmations that I wrote for me. I said, Jesus is first in my life. It's not about me. It's all about him. I love my wife and will serve her because leaders are servants. My children will love God and serve him. I will nurture, equip, and empower them to do more for his kingdom than they could ever possibly imagine. Jesus didn't die so I could play it safe. He died so that I would live dangerously for him. So I will do anything short of sin to see people far from God come near. I am disciplined. I do first what matters most. I practice the power of saying, and because of that, I grow closer to Jesus every single day. I am as tough as nails. The harder life hits, the deeper I will go in Christ. I am gifted, called, and equipped to preach the word of God, and I promise to preach every message like it's my last in order to reach people no one else is reaching. I will do things no one else is doing. I will innovate, create, and draw others to Christ in ways people never thought possible. I will point out potential in others. That is not something I do. That is who I am. I will bring my best and then some. It's what I bring after I do my best that makes all the difference. And I believe that the world will be a different and better place because I serve Jesus today. That's how I start my day. And it's changing me. And I'm creating some new pathways. And I'm not where I want to be, but I'm not where I was. You know, this is the beginning of summer, the unofficial beginning of summer, Memorial Day. And I'm kind of praying within my heart that I look radically different come Labor Day at the end of summer. I want to be a different person. I want to be that new creation that God has called me to be. I want to be set free. I want to be attractive. I want to be a part of that church that draws people to itself because people ask the question, what do they have? What does he have? What does she have that I don't have? And we'll be able to tell them that it's Jesus. He's done a work in our heart. And that work has moved from our heart to our head. And now it's coming out in our hands and in our work and people are starting to notice. Your life is always moving in the direction of your strongest thoughts. So do you like where your thoughts are taking you? The life you have is a reflection of the thoughts that you think. Your life, it's always moving in that direction of the strongest thoughts. You cannot have a positive life with a negative mind. Because what comes into your mind will ultimately come out in your life. We need to remember that most of life's battles, they are won or lost in the mind. What you believe, it actually determines how you will behave. But here's been my prayer all week. The transformation that we see in Paul's life. Acts chapter 9 through Acts chapter 28. Paul is a completely different person, transformed by the love and the grace of God. And when I get to the end of my life, I want to be a transformed person. Again, all of us. We not, might not be where we want to be, but let's not be uh, where we were. L let's move forward. Let's continue to take steps. Let's keep chasing after Jesus and believing that his spirit, alive and well and at work within us, can transform us into that new creation, that we can be that early church that was so magnetic, so attractive, that people came to him in droves. Let's pray. Jesus Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you are alive and your spirit is at work in us. 
Lord, help us overcome our stinking thinking. Help us win the battle in the mind. Help us break free from those mental bars and be set free people, living the life that you have called us to live, that abundant life that you have for us, that magnetic and attractive life that you have for us. And I pray that you don't do it just for one person, but collectively you would do it for us all so that we could be that church, that group of people who is seeing the day where there is a fully devoted follower in every home in this valley and beyond. Jesus, we are your willing vessels. Do a work within us. Change us from the inside out. Lord, we love you. And it's in your name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Thank you for joining us. We really hope God spoke to you, but we don't want this conversation to end here. We want to continue this conversation with you throughout the week. That's why we have our online Facebook group, CCV Online Campus. You can join today, invite your friends to join, and we'll continue this conversation with you. I hope to connect with you really soon.